Welcome or welcome back to the Company of the Cat. Hi! In today's upload, I want to talk about the magical bloodlines of the First Men. This is a concept I've had for a long time as a general idea in mind, but I decided on a video because of two comments I got. It is a theory about why the First Men have magical bloodlines and what they did to achieve this. Before we begin, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy my content, and without further ado, let's go. I have a lot of videos about Valyrian and fire magic on this channel, and two of them are about fire magic and its connection to blood sacrifices. The other one is about the dragon babies of House Targaryen. In the first one, among everything else, I also said that blood is necessary for every type of magic, not just fire magic. And in the second one, I said that a big reason for the magical blood of the dragon is the dragon babies. I suggested that the dragon lords sacrifice their blood in advance, so they could have and continue to have a special bloodline and a dragon bond. The lizard babies are the sacrifices for their magic. To have magical blood, they need to sacrifice it, and this blood is their kids. Blood for fire and fire for blood. They have to keep giving their blood to keep the fire in it. In both these uploads, I got two similar comments that I thought were great conversation starters for this video. The first one read, no blood, no magic doesn't seem quite right. Skin changers don't need to kill everyone for their abilities. Only blood and maybe fire magic could require some type of sacrifice to fuel it. And the one about the dragon baby said that the Starks and the First Men don't align. Fire magic is more in your face, and we have seen it in the novels more, along with the fire and blood motto of the Targaryens. We associated blood magic mostly with fire, but blood magic is very much present in every form of magic used by humans, and the First Men lines are built on blood magic just as much. And this is what I want to talk about today. But first, what is a blood sacrifice exactly? You'll have gold, horses, whatever you like. It is not matter of gold or horses. This is blood magic, lady. Only death may pay for life. Death? Danny wrapped her arms around herself protectively, rocked back and forth on her heels. My death? She told herself she would die for him if she must. She was the blood of the dragon. She would not be afraid. Blood sacrifice doesn't always require fresh blood at the same moment. It is the general exchange of death for life. By itself, the blood is nothing. You do not have the words to make a spell, nor the wisdom to find them. Do you think blood magic is a game for children? The information we get from the House of Black and White is the best to understand what blood magic actually is. Can you pay the price? What price? The price is you. The price is all you have and all you ever hope to have. We took your eyes and gave them back. Next we will take your ears and you will walk in silence. You will give us your legs and crawl. You'll be no one's daughter, no one's wife, no one's mother. Your name will be a lie, and the very face you wear will not be your own. I only just came from Westeros. Sometimes it seems a thousand years since she was fled King's Landing, and sometimes it seems like only yesterday. But she knew she could not go back. I'll go if you don't want me, but I won't go there. My wants do not matter, said the kindly man. It may be the many-faced God has led you here to be his instrument, but when I look at you I see a child. And worse, a girl child. Many have served him of many faces through the centuries, but only a few of his servants have been women. Women bring life into the world. We bring the gift of death. No one can do both. The wave showed ten fingers, then ten again, and yet again, then six. Her face remained as smooth as still water. She can be six and thirty, Arya thought. She's a little girl. You're lying, she said. The wave shook her head and showed her once again, ten and ten and ten and six. She said the word for six and thirty, and made Arya say them too. The next day she told the kindly man what the wave had claimed. She did not lie, the priest said chuckling. The one you call Wave is a woman grown who has spent her life serving him of many faces. She gave him all she was, all she ever might have been, all the lives that were within her. Blood magic is not necessarily about giving blood as a currency, but about giving life. In the House of Black and White, they give their life to serve death, even sacrificing their potential life they might bring forth, to serve the many-faced God. The reason the author chose the word blood is the fact that blood is often symbolically associated with life force, vitality, and the essence of existence. In many creation myths, blood played a central role in the emergence of life, it's believed to carry throughout the body the essence of life itself. 
Blood sacrifice was common in mythological traditions and cultures, seen as a means of renewing life, appeasing deities, or maintaining cosmic balance. Many mythologies attribute its special significance to royal or divine bloodlines, linking them to supernatural powers and divine authority, concepts echoed in the novels. Blood sacrifice encompasses the sacrifice of life in general, whether by denouncing one's life as a whole, sacrificing the lives of future children like the Waif and Daenerys, or sacrificing someone for a quick spell, as Melisandre does. Magic always has a price, whether it involves fire or not. In a sense, those you call the children of the forest have eyes as golden as the sun, but once in a great while one is born amongst them with eyes as red as blood, or green as the moss on a tree in the heart of the forest. By these signs do the god marks those who have chosen to receive the gift. The chosen ones are not robust, and their quick years upon the earth are few, for every song must have its balance. But once inside the wood, they linger long indeed. A thousand eyes, a hundred skins, wisdom deep as the roots of ancient trees, green seers. I never asked for the crown, gold is cold and heavy on the head, but so long I am the king, I have a duty. If I may sacrifice one child to the flames to save a million from the dark, sacrifice is never easy, Davos. Or it is no true sacrifice. Tell him, my lady. Melisandre said, as Orahai tempered lime bringer with the heart's blood of his own beloved wife, if a man with a thousand cows gives one to God, that is nothing. But a man who offers the only cow he owns. If you had the horn of Yoramun all along, why haven't you used it? Why bother building turtles and setting thens to kill us in our beds? If this horn is all the songs say, why not just sound it and be done? It was Dalla who answered him, Dalla great with child, playing on her pile of furs beside the brazier. We free folk know things you kneelers have forgotten. Sometimes the short road is not the safest, Jon Snow. The Horn Lord once said that sorcery is a sword without a hilt. There is no safe way to grasp it. It's made of ice, Jon pointed out. You know nothing, Jon Snow. This wall is made of blood. So this magical icy wall is made of blood. Green seers were very weak and died quickly. Magic is dangerous and has a price. And the bigger the price, the stronger the power. If everyone gives something for their power, if indeed the Dragon Lords gave something, then the first men lines also paid the price to make their bloodlines magical. The magic associated with the first men bloodlines is similar to the green magic used by the children of the forest. After the pact and the end of the conflicts between the singers and the first men, the humans, with very few exceptions, like the sister men and the ironborn, started to believe in the old gods of the children of the forest and gained some of the green powers as well. We of course see people with some skin changing and green seer abilities, various wood witches, and the powers Mira and Jodzen claim the Cranog men like their dad Howland have. We do not know exactly how the first men acquired these powers, but there are quite a few stories about interbreeding with the singers. Last, and so might say the least, the people of the north are the swamp dwellers of the neck known as Cranog men for the floating islands on which they raise their holes and hovels. A small sly people, some say they are small in stature because they intermarried with the children of the forest. To win the veil, he flew to the top of the giant's lance and slew the griffin king. He counted giants and merlings among his friends, and wed a woman of the children of the forest, though she died giving birth to his son. So humans might have acquired these powers from the singers, indeed. But it actually raises other questions. For starters, in the stories of Garth the Green, which seem they take place before the pact, we see green powers used by humans and children getting slaughtered. Not by random people, but by alleged children of his. Brandon of the Bloody Blade, who drove the giants from the ridge and warred against the children of the forest, slaying so many at Blue Lake that it was been known as Red Lake ever since. Even if the stories are embellished myths, it kinda looks like humans were using magic, and specifically green magic, before the pact took place, and the humans were at odds with the singers. That being said, the magic the humans did was 100% blood magic. Garth Greenhand we call him, but in the oldest tales he is named Garth Greenhair, or simply Garth the Green. Some stories say he had green hands, green hair, or green skin overall. A few even give him antlers, like a stag. Others tell us that he dressed in green from head to toe, and certainly this is how he is most commonly depicted in paintings, tapestries, and sculptures. More likely, his sobriquet derived from his gifts as a gardener and a tiler of the soil. The one trait on which all the tales agree. Garth made the corn ripen, the trees fruit, and the flowers bloom, the singers tell us. A few of the very oldest tales of Garth Greenhand present us with a considerably darker deity one who demanded blood sacrifice from his worshippers to ensure a bountiful harvest. In some stories, the green god dies every autumn when the trees loses their leaves, only to be reborn with the coming of spring. This version of Garth is largely forgotten. 
my first video for this channel was about Garth and the Weirwoods and how the Weirwoods, at least to me, sound very much like undead trees, specifically oaks. I will revisit this theory in a future video, by the way, because I want to add some more things and new ideas I got while rereading for today's upload. It doesn't change much, to be honest, but just to be clear, I will change my first theory a little bit in the future because I found things I hadn't noticed at the time. In any case, weirwoods look like they are in a state of immortality of some sort. They don't die according to Bloodraven, but they also look like they have lost their vitality. Leaf gave Bran a paste from weirwood seeds, but no one ever mentions that they have seeds. We have countless depictions of weirwoods, their leaves and barks and faces, but no one ever mentions anything about seeds. Not even fallen on the ground under the canopy, like with every normal tree. Additionally, even if they had seeds, why did they never try to plant more? The children never tried to plant when the humans were cutting them down and burning them. Same about the first men. Why? No one knows how to plant one, and in the only place we have seen a relatively young weirwood, the Cracklow Point, we also got a line about how they water the trees with blood. It is a line used mostly to point out how the Cracklow men were killing every invader in the land, but it's a very weird way of wording it. Every heap of stones had a story, and Nibble Dick told them all. To hear him tell it, the men of Cracklow Point had watered their pine trees with blood. Brienne's patience soon began to fray. How much longer? she demanded finally. We must have seen every tree in Cracklow Point by now. Not hardly, said Crab. Soldier pines were everywhere, down up in solemn ranks. In the mist was a pale stranger, a slender young weirwood with a trunk as wide as a cloistered maid. Dark red leaves sprouted from its reaching branches. The weirwoods are considered eternal and immortal, but they also look very lifeless and they cannot reproduce. People were also making blood sacrifices to them. The trees too have given something to be able to be everlasting and deathless. In the myths about Garth, I said that he sounds pretty much like a living weirwood. Garth sounds like a tree. He sounds like a more poetic way to describe a tree. Five lobed leaves look like hands. Weirwood leaves are described like that all the time. The hard tree had always frightened him. Trees ought not have eyes, Bran thought, or leaves that look like hands. The leaves also look like the hair of the tree. The branches also resemble antlers. He lived a very, very long life, and he was dying every autumn along with the trees because he was indeed a tree. <laughs> the humans found a way to tame the magic of the trees, and thus they were offering blood. Jojen even points out how there is power in the wood, not only in weirwoods. The gods would. Mira Reed ran after the direwolf, her shield and frog spear to hand. The rest of them trailed after, threading their way through smoke and fallen stones. The air was sweeter under the trees. A few pines along the edges of the wood had been scorched, but deeper in the damp soil and green wood had defeated the flames. There is a power in living wood, said George and Reed, almost as if he knew what Bran was thinking. A power strong as fire. It looks like some sort of power could be channeled from normal trees as well. And it kind of makes sense, since the info we get about other people who use green powers, like the Roiner and the Granogmen, does not always involve weirwoods. And yet there was a difference in degree, if not in kind for almost all the noble houses of the rich shared a common ancestry deriving as they did from Garth Greenhand and his many children. It was that kinship many scholars have suggested that gave House Gardener the primacy in the centuries that followed. No petty king could ever hope to rival the power of High Garden, where Garth the Gardener's descendants sat upon a living throne, the oak and seed, that grew from an oak that Garth Greenhand himself had planted, and wore crowns of vines and flowers when at peace, and crowns of bronze thorns, later iron, when they rode to war. If we imagine how Brynden and now Bran sit on their weirwood thrones, but with the people sitting on their oak thrones, like the one of Garth, this story sound like a tree and the king that was sitting on the tree. The figure mingling around with every woman was the first gardener, but the green god that needed blood and was dying every autumn was the tree. All the famous kids of Garth sound like the offspring of the first night custom as well. Kids from these couplings were not just kids of the king, they were kids of the gods. At the time and age, the first night was important and much more than a quickie for the king. It was a blessing and magic was involved and passed to all these children. Through time, the different stories and people involved became a big, colorful, exaggerated myth, like in every mythology. In the current timeline, they don't believe in magic anymore, so the real guard was just a powerful king, and all the magic involved was exaggerated and turned into a mysterious green god. It is easy to see how stories involve magic become skewed with time from the things they say about skin changers as well. What they believe about them and what these people actually can do is vastly different. Wood witches also meddled with blood magic. 
they were not just women who knew some healing and herb lore, as some maesters claim, they were more than that. The good witch that Herdon and Harlon married, both kings of a king, kept them young. King Mer III Gardener gave golden honors to a wood witch, who claimed she could raise armies of the dead to fight off the Andals if they invaded the Ritz. The wife of Sir Clarence Crabbe was a wood witch, and she could bring back to life with a kiss the heads of those killed by Clarence. According to Septon Eustace, Alice River was a wood witch. People were saying that Alice was much older than she looked and was using blood to keep herself young, similar to the stories of Sierra's sister. She could predict some stuff as well, and we are told that she gave her unborn children to acquire these powers. It seems like the children of the forest are a naturally magical race, but they too have given something. And they did sing. They sang in true tongue, so Brand could not understand the words, but their voices were as pure as winter air. Where are the rest of you? Bran asked Cliff once. Gone down into the earth, she answered. Into the stones, into the trees. Before the first men came, all this land that you call Westeros was home to us, yet even in those days we were few. The gods gave us long lives, but not great numbers. Lest we overrun the world as deer will overrun a wood where there are no wolves to hunt them. The singers of the forest had no books, no ink, no parchment, no written language. Instead they had the trees and the weirwoods above all. When they died, they went into the wood into leaf and leaf and root, and the trees remembered. All their songs are spells, their histories and prayers, everything they knew about this world. Maesters will tell you that the weirwoods are sacred to the old gods. The singers believe they are the old gods. When singers die, they become part of that godhood. The children have very long lifespan and also some powers, but they are very few and the power returns back to their gods, who gave it to them. When they wanted to make something that would disturb this balance, like the hammer, they too practice blood magic, they kill their children. The children can grow close and skin change into other animals, but the strongest of them, green seers, were very rare. It was considered a gift and they were seen as holy. There is an undeniable balance and harmony, does the name singers, I think. It seems that sounds and songs have power and a lot of it too. But this is another conversation for another video. If intermarriage with the singers took place, then the neck is probably the only area where it was to a very big extent. And the humans learned their songs and magic, and some of them had skin-changing abilities as well. Long ago, the histories claim, the Cranog men were ruled by the Marsh Kings. Singers tell of them riding on lizard lions and using great frog spears like lances. But that is clearly fancy. Were the Marsh Kings even truly kings as we understand it? Archmaster Aaron writes that the Cranog men saw their kings as the first among equals who were often thought to be touched by the old gods, a fact that was said to show itself in eyes of strange hues, or even in speaking with animals, as the children are said to have done. The Granog men still live believing in the same balance as the singers, and they talk about people who were touched by the gods in the same way it happened with the children of the forest, not exactly the same way as we see it in other humans. What do the trees remember? The secrets of the old gods, said Jordan Reed. Food and fire and rest had helped restore him after the ordeals of the journey. But he seemed sadder now, sullen, with a weary handed look about the eyes. Truth the first man knew, forgotten now in Winterfell, but not in the wet wild. We live closer to the green in our bogs and crannogs, and we remember. Earth and water, soil and stone, oaks and elms and willows, they were here before us and will still remain when we are gone. North of the Wall, another place where the people are more aware of magic and fairly knowledgeable on first man stories and customs, where we see people actually being born with skin changing abilities, things are much, much different as well. People are very cautious of magic, skin changers are also kind of outcasts and people are afraid of them, even though they are somewhat respected. And we even learn about skin changers who were wary of their own powers, like Hagon. Abomination. That had always been Hagon's favorite word. Abomination, abomination, abomination. To eat of human meat was abomination, to mate as wolf with wolf was abomination, and to seize the body of another man was the worst abomination of all. Hagon was weak, afraid of his own power. He died weeping and alone when I ripped his second life from him. Varamir had devoured his heart himself. He taught me much and more, and the last thing I learned from him was the taste of human flesh. Asshole. And of course, they really do not like blood magic. They don't like the wall because they say blood was part of its construction. And they didn't blow the horn for the same reason as well. But skin changing powers are also very much a gift, like the green seeds of the children of the forest. 
Some very few people get to have them, and as we saw from the Varamir prologue, also returned to the gods after their death, and before they settled for a second simpler life in their animals. The white world turned and fell away. For a moment it was as if you were inside the weirwood, gazing out through card red eyes as a dying man twitched feebly on the ground, and a mad woman danced blindly and bloody underneath the moon, weeping red tears and dripping at her clothes. Then both were gone and he was rising, melting, his spirit born into some cold wing. He was in the snow and in the clouds, he was a sparrow, a squirrel, an oak. A horned owl flew silently between his trees, hunting an air. Varamir was inside the owl, inside the air, inside the trees. Deep below the frozen ground, earthworms burrowed blindly in the dark. And he was them as well. I am the wood and everything that's in it, he thought exulting. A hundred ravens took to the air, cowing as they felt him pass. A grey elk trumpeted and settling, and children clicking to his back. A sleeping direwolf raised his head to snarl at empty air. Before their hearts could beat again, he had passed on searching for his own, for one nice lion stalker, for his pack. His wolf would save him, he told himself. That was his last thought as a man. Sadly, we do not have the backstory of other skin angels over the wall, but at least about Varamir, we learn that, like the green seeds of the singers, he was sickly and weak as a child. These powers didn't go to a random, normal, healthy kid. She weeps for Bump, but she never wept for me. Lamb had been born a month before his proper time, and he was sick so often that no one expected him to leave. His mother waited until he was four to give him a proper name. And by then it was too late. The whole village had taken to call him Lamb, the name his sister Mecha gave him when he was still in their mother's belly. Mecha had given Bump his name as well, but Lamb's little brother had been born in his proper time, big and red and robust, sucking greedy at mother's teeth. She was going to name him after father. Bump died, though. He died when he was two and I was six, three days before his name day. Your little one is with the gods now, the woods witch told his mother as he wept. He'll never hurt again, never hunger, never cry. The gods have taken him down into the earth, into the trees. The gods are all around us, in the rocks and streams, in the birds and beasts. Your bum has gone to join them. He'll be the world and all that's in it. In the religion of the old gods, they believe what the children of the forest believe as well. Upon their death, their spirit joins the whole of nature, their gods, so when someone has the gift, their power returns to the gods. Again, there is a very specific balance to how these powers work. For humans, some of them have the gift of skin changing, but it is very random and a gift that, like green searing, manifests in weaker individuals, as it seems. They have a weaker body, so they are gifted with a stronger spirit. And that brings me to the most important information we get, but kinda dismiss. Skin changing normally is not hereditary. The kids of skin changers are not skin changers themselves, and so far, whatever skin changer we have seen north of the wall didn't have skin changer parents. The power is not hereditary. Before months, Varamir's sick skins had been a lord of sorts. He lived alone in a hall of moss and mud and hewn logs that had once been hagons attended by his beasts. A dozen villages did him homage in bread and salt and cider, offering him fruit from their orchards and vegetables from their gardens. His meat he got himself. Whatever he desired a woman, he sent his shadow cow to stall her, and whatever girl he cast his eyes upon would follow meekly to his bed. Some came weeping, I, But still they came. Varamir gave him his seed, took a hang of their hair to remember them by, and sent them back. From time to time, some village hero would come with spear and hand to slay the beastling and save the sister or a lover or a daughter. Those he killed, but he never harmed the women. Some he even blessed with children, runs, small funny things like lamp, and not one with a gift. Again, asshole. Humans are not a race like the children are. They live shorter lives and have found ways to reproduce and spread everywhere, unlike most other animals. Imagine if everyone was magical. Chaos. Even now, when the wrong person meddles with magic, like Euron, things can go to shit very quickly. So it seems like skin changing abilities were given kinda at random to people who were relatively weak and healthy, like Varamir, whose parents and children were not magical like him. Skin changers are sand. Varamir was given to Hagon by his parents because they were afraid of him and lived most of his life alone. If they could have families that are also magical, why are there so few over the wall? It looks like Varamir is not the exception in that. This power is not hereditary naturally. So the people south of the wall did something to have this power remain in specific bloodlines. And that smells like blood magic to me. And yes, it probably was blood magic, because I think the people south of the wall 
bound their heart rates to their bloodlines. Even the name heart rate and the concept of it hint at that. The tree is the heart of the family. The heart pumps blood around, but it also serves only one body and belongs to a circulatory system. The heart sends blood throughout the body, carrying oxygen to every cell. The blood delivers the oxygen and returns to the heart. The heart then sends the blood to the lungs to pick up more oxygen and the circle repeats over and over and over again for one's body to stay alive. The concept of a heart rate does not exist over the world, from what I understand. Here every castle had its god's wood, and every god's wood had its heart tree, and every heart tree its face. A heart tree was a weirwood in the gardens of castles. The term heart tree is used only south of the wall. North of the wall, they are just weirwoods. People south of the wall, like John, tend to call the weirwoods heart trees in general, but the wildlings don't. And heart trees are not even always weirwoods. So it seems like it is a southern first man thing, not a first man in general thing. On top of that, the weirwood faces change over the wall, something that doesn't seem to be the case with the heart trees. Sam did not know what he hoped to find in the empty houses. Maybe the wildlings had left some food behind. He had to take a look. John had searched the hands at White Tree on their way north. Inside one hovel, Sam heard the rustling of rats from a darker corner. But otherwise, there was nothing in any of them, but all straw, all smells, and all ashes beneath the smoke hole. He turned back to the weirwood and studied the carved face for a moment. It is not the face we saw, he admitted to himself. The tree is not half as big as the one at White Tree. The red eyes wept blood, and he didn't remember that either. Clumsily, Sam sank to his knees. All gods hear my prayer. The seven were my father's gods, but I said my words to you when I joined the watch. Help us now. I fear we might be lost. We're hungry too and so cold. I don't know what gods I believe in now, but... Please, if you're there, help us. Gilly has a little son. That was all he could think to say. The dusk was dipping, the leaves of the weirwoods rustling softly, waving like a thousand blood-red hands. Whether John's god had heard him or not, he could not say. I'm guessing that someone would have noticed if something like that happened with Hartree's. We have the faces of some weirwoods, and we know that the Stark Hartree, at least, looks like a Stark. At the center of the grove, an ancient weirwood brooded over a small pool where the waters were black and cold. The Hartree, Ned called it. The weirwood's bark was white as bone, its leaves dark red, like a thousand blood-stained hands. A face had been carved in the trunk at the great tree, its features long and melancholy. The deep cut eyes red with dried sap and strangely watchful. From the first time I read the books, I always had the same question. Why do they not bend their dead in the north like the wildlings? All first men houses south of the wall have crypts and barrows. Even if they were buried their deads in the beginning, you would think that some people, especially those in the north, would stick to burning after the long night just to be safe. But they didn't. And the reason they didn't is because all these dead, I think, are connected to the heart ring. They need to be connected to the heart ring. Brand's cave could be described as a crypt as well, and the bones do look connected to the trees. Bones, said Bran. It's bones. The floor of the passage was littered with bones of birds and beasts. But there were other bones as well, big ones that must have been from giants, and small ones that would have been from children. On either side of them, in niches carved from the stone, skulls looked down on them. Bran saw a bear skull and a wolf skull, half a dozen human skulls, and near as many giants. All the rest were small, queerly formed, children of the forest. The roots had grown in and around and through them. Everyone. He found chambers full of bones, shafts that plant deep into the earth, a place where the skeleton of gigantic bats hung upside down from the ceiling. He even crossed the slender stone bridge that arched over the abyss and discovered more passages and chambers onto the far side. One was full of singers, enthroned like Brynden in nests of weirwood roots that woven under and through and around their bodies. Most of them looked dead to him, but as he crossed in front of them, their eyes would open and follow the light of his torch. And one of them opened and closed a wrinkled mouth, as if he were trying to speak. The whole cave system is pretty similar to the Stark crypts. Underground, maze-like tunnels that go very deep, and the green seers, the wise men, the chosen ones, the blessed ones, meaning the closest equivalent to kings that the children of the forest have, sitting on thrones with their animals often close by. The only difference being that they are in the open and not in tombs with statues. 
That being said, we have no idea what is going on in the very, very old part of the crypt that has collapsed, but I'm going to take a guess and say it is similar, and all the dead are buried under the heart tree and connected to its roots. The free folk refer to themselves to differentiate themselves from kneelers, the people south of the wall subject to lords and kings. They view southerners as liking freedom. The biggest issue is the law and concept in general of property. The gods made the earth for all men to share. Only when the kings come with their crowns and steel swords, they claimed it was all theirs. My trees, they said, you can eat them apples. My stream, you can fish here. My wood, you're not to hunt. My earth, my water, my castle, my daughter, keep your hands away or I'll chop them off. But maybe if you kneel to me, I'll let you have a sniff. You call us thieves, but at least a thief has to be brave and clever and quick. A kneeler only has to kneel. If we add a weirwood tree to the mix of what Ygritte listed, things start to get more serious than just property. Because a weirwood in the wood of a castle that is the property of someone is pretty much what a heart tree is. The first high king we learn of is Garth, who is described as a magical person. We see three combined enormous weirwoods, someone who demanded blood sacrifices, and three thrones in his story. We also have seen many people paralleling Garth in the current timeline. People like Robert and Euron, people like Varamir. These people had power and took, and in Euron's case keep on taking, full advantage of it, with little care about the rest of the people. As we saw before, the powers above the wall pop up pretty much at random. People believe in the gods, pray to them, most likely give sacrifices, and believe they merge with them after their death. Something that must be the case since Varamir went into everything in nature and so through the weirwood. There was a whole village in Whitery, not just a castle. And many clans and tribes are very often on the move and not set settlements. What would happen if a magical and fireful person decided that they are better than the rest because they are magical, not unlike Varamir who was in a hat, and people in his vicinity were giving him food and other goods because they were afraid, and said, yo guys, this land is mine, this weirwood included by the way, and you cannot do much because, unlike you, I have magic lol. If one magical person slash bloodline sacrifices to this specific tree, gets buried close slash under it, and even when they want to benefit others, they are the ones that do the sacrifices and the offerings, then it kind of makes sense that the power will continue to be in their bloodline. Since this weirwood gets power only from them and returns the power back to them. We learn about various kids of Garth, and they all sound magical, special. But what if they weren't? What if they were unwanted for X, Y reason? Craster, for example, gives the boys as a sacrifice to the others, and is safe. He even calls himself a godly man. If the gods in question were not the others, and you started giving these kids to the trees as a sacrifice, I imagine your bloodline would be the blessed one. Everyone has sacrificed something for their powers, health, kin, loved ones something, and giving children as a sacrifice is a very prominent pattern in the novels. The first man did have a custom that led to an almost unlimited number of kids. Kids from a king, someone that at that time was more often than not magical. Small folk and common people were sharing the limited amount of uncut weirwoods with each other, and the singers as well, so I imagine as it happens over the wall in the current timeline, every now and then a human was born with powers, but if one magical person started to gatekeep a weirwood, maybe even did a blood magic spell to bind it to their own blood, gave blood sacrifices only from their blood, and buried only their own kin directly under it, then the power would return only to their own bloodline. And if one person did this, then others would do the same, even if they weren't magical, and just had the opportunity. Clarence Crabbe and Herdon and Harlon are not described as magical themselves, but they did find magical wives and establish their own kingdoms. That would explain why the Hartrees are called Hartrees, why they resemble the family that owns them, and their faces do not change, why every godswood has or had one, why the first men would not burn their dead even after the long night, and why the wildlings are so hostile towards the concept of kinship and wary of magic, especially blood magic. The free folk choose their leaders, and the kings beyond the wall are people who everybody wants to follow. The Kranog men had kings with powers chosen by the gods, first among equals. When this power is harnessed, like the dragon lords with the dragons, 
and becomes something exclusive and hereditary, it loses its meaning because these people are not chosen by the gods anymore. King's blood is a phrase we hear quite often in the novels, especially by Mel, but I think the meaning has been corrupted. Royal blood is something people believe to have properties, but this notion has been seriously changed through centuries. People in the current timeline believe it is about the king's blood, power, etc. But looking at what we know, I think this phrase was about magical blood, not royal. The kings of gods were magical. In the beginning, these people were considered blessed, and this is why those around them made them kings. After people started to take things into their own hands completely and decided that they were kings, and even practiced magic to become or remain magical, almighty kings, and the logic got reversed from you are special, thus you will become a king, became you are special because you are a king. The logic and morals involved are very, very different. Kings should be the most competent people who care for the fellow men and look out for the common good, not solely for their own gain. With magic slowly vanishing, this phrase remains, but the meaning has been distorted. This is it, pretty much. I think that the reason for the magical bloodlines of First Men Origin we have only south of the wall is because they found a way to bind the weirwoods to them. The issues with the free folk go a step further than just kingship. The gatekeeping and the struggle were real. I will make another video where I'll talk about the weirwoods more and will revisit my theory about them as well, add another interesting thing I found while reading, and also throw in a theory about Ned's bones that have done the round of Westeros in 80 days. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe and write your thoughts and theories about the Weirwoods and the Heartrees and whatever else you want to talk about. And until the next one, bye!